So welcome everyone. Welcome to the Geneva Historical Society's first history sandwiched in of the 2021 uh, season. Um, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. So although you are all very, very welcoming, uh, I'm going to ask all of you to go on mute. You can do that by clicking on the um, microphone icon. It just helps um, with anybody. You might be with someone, so it just helps keeping down the feedback. Okay. Um, my name is Carrie Lippincott. I am the executive director of the Geneva Historical Society. Um, so I've already asked you to go on mute. The other thing is at the end of the program, I'm going to welcome any and all questions uh, you might have. So if you have any questions throughout the program, I'm going to ask you to put that in the chat box. Okay. Uh, Ann Daly, who is our director of education, she's going to be monitoring that throughout the program. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate um, to put it put your questions in the chat box. So again, if you could put yourselves on mute, I would appreciate it. What is that? Aren't I muted? Okay, I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna mention a few things we have coming up. Uh, they will all be on our website uh, sooner or later, but I wanna let you know, we've got a lot going on, mostly on Zoom these days. So uh, make sure if you do not already subscribe to our weekly updates that you subscribe to those uh, because that lets you know what's coming. We also have um, programs with the Antiques Club of the Finger Lakes. There is one at the end of this month. Um, it's not on our calendar yet, so I don't have all the information right in front of me, but uh, they'll be having Jane, who's one of our participants today, talk about uh, hops and uh, brewing here in the Genesee Valley region. I say here because I'm working from home in the Rochester area, so I'm actually in the Genesee Valley today. Uh, but keep an eye out for that. Um, we welcome everyone to sign up for that, whether you're a member of Antiques Club, a member of the Historical Society, just interested in Geneva history. We've also got Preston Pierce, Ontario County histori uh, historian, speaking about the Rochester and Eastern Railway this month on the 18th. I just secured that, so there's nothing up about it yet, but I'm putting things up about that. We have um, a pretty active social media accounts with lots of interesting content going up there. So if you're on Facebook or Instagram, like us because you'll get that information then. So those are my little advertisements. Uh, I don't think Carrie needs any introduction. Are you ready to go, Carrie? I'm good to go, good okay. to go. Okay. Dear Brother Mark, though I was sick three weeks in September, health to a pretty good degree is again restored and I doubted whether it was prudent for me to attempt to end this course of lectures, but resolved to try and hope to go through. Still, it's quite a tax on my mental and physical energies to sit five hours, only three hours Saturdays, every day attentively listening to medical lectures. Besides, it's expected of students, and indeed they find it necessary if they bear a good daily examination to read the various subjects of the lectures during the interval. If, however, I find myself unequal to the task, I should only hear the lectures and reserve the reading for the future. In the medical college are three large lecture rooms, one directly above the other. The basement, a semicircular amphitheater, is appropriate to the lectures and illustrations of the professor of chemistry and pharmacy, James Hadley, MD. The upper room, a circular amphitheater, is occupied by professor of anatomy and physiology, James Webster, MD. By the professor of obstetrics and medical jurisprudence, Charles Coventry, MD, and the principles and practice of surgery, Frank Hastings. Hamilton, MD. The last two professors lectured during the last half of the term. The middle, a large square room with an elevation for the speaker is devoted to lectures of the professor of institutes and practices of medicines, Thomas Spencer, MD. And the professor of materia medica and general pathology, Charles Lee, MD. Professor Webster and Lee finished their course during the first half of the term or eight weeks. Professor Spencer and Hadley lecture through the term. Corden LaFord is demonstrator of anatomy and librarian. At present, we meet Professor Webster at 9 a.m., Professor Hadley at 10 a.m., Professor Spencer at 11 a.m., Professor Lee, 2 p.m., Professor Webster again at 3 p.m. This is the usual order, subject to variations, however. At the beginning of each lecture, questions are asked on the preceding lecture, each student in turn being questioned, each professor having a list of names. Three students room with me, all pious professedly, and quite agreeable roommates. If we board ourselves, each taking his turn of one week to prepare, 
our meals. We think our board and room rent will not exceed a dollar a week each. It is nine o'clock. I will finish this next week. This letter from Joseph Banks dated November 1st, 1845, provides a pretty good perspective on what it was like to attend the Geneva Medical College during its heyday in the 1840s. When people ask me what we do at the Geneva Historical Society, the simplest answer is we tell the stories of Geneva. And one of those stories is, of course, the Medical College. Today, along with celebrating Elizabeth Blackwell's 200th birthday, I would like to share the college's story with you by answering a few basic questions like what the medical education was like in the 19th century and why a medical college was established in Geneva and what eventually happened to the college. Before delving into the medical college's story, a brief overview of medical education in the United States during the 18th and 19th centuries would be helpful. Medical schools were actually slow to develop in the United States. Before the American Revolution, there were three ways to train as a doctor, private lessons, an apprenticeship with a doctor, or with those with funds going abroad and studying at universities in Edinburgh, London, or Paris. And I'm just gonna mention this again, folks, it would help if you could put yourselves on mute. Um, that just cuts back on the background noise. Um, you can find the mute button. Um, it looks like a microphone. Uh, it might be at the bottom of your screen or it could be on the top of your screen, depending on if you have an iPad or if you're on a computer. Starting in 1765 with the University of Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, medical schools began appearing in the United States. By 1833, 28 medical schools existed, half of which are still in operation today. For most of the 1800s, medical schools pretty much offered the same course of study. Though a bachelor's degree was not required for admission, students had to be proficient in at least Latin, English, and the natural sciences, be of fair moral character, study three years with a doctor, and be able to pay the fees. You see, medical schools were proprietary. This meant the faculty divided the lecture and student fees amongst themselves. So the more students, the more money the faculty made. The actual course of study included two 16 week terms in core subjects like biology, pathology, chemistry, and anatomy. Students attended at least four lectures a day, read supplemental materials, memorized information, and observed operations and dissections. A student, in fact, could go through both terms without even seeing a patient. To receive a degree, a student had to pass oral exams in subjects like anatomy, surgery, obstetrics, uh, chemistry, and write and defend a thesis. After graduation, the new doctor could set up a practice, gain additional training by working in a hospital, or for those with uh, money, go to Europe for additional education. Paris was the primary destination. And after the Civil War, Austrian and German universities became places to receive training in a specialty or the basic sciences. Of course, licensing agencies didn't require medical practitioners to have a medical degree or a formal education. So you didn't necessarily even have to have a degree or attend medical school to set up a medical practice. Hobart College for Men was founded as Geneva College with instruction beginning in 1822. The impetus for the college came from Reverend John Henry Hobart, Episcopal Bishop of the Diocese of New York, who thought the prosperous and growing community of Geneva would be best place to expand the church's reach into Western New York. The first building constructed was Geneva Hall, followed by Middle Building in 1836 and Trinity Hall in 1837. The original curriculum was similar to the standard classical education taught in American colleges at the time. Classes included, included English grammar, geography, Latin and Greek, mathematics, rhetoric, moral and natural philosophy, and elements of history. Also included were practical courses in science, mathematics for, for young men who are not entering the learned professions. The school was renamed Hobart College in 1860 in recognition of Bishop's role in, in its creation. There were actually two attempts to establish a medical college affiliated with Hobart. In the 1820s, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, now part of Columbia University in New York City, had a monopoly over medical education in New, in New York State and a board of trustees to protect that monopoly. In 1826, five unhappy faculty members tried to remove the college's trustees. When they were unsuccessful, the five faculty members resigned and tried to start their own medical school. Pitfall number one. The College of Physicians and Surgeons prevented the new school from being, from being chartered. Without a charter, the school could not open. So the 
former faculty approached Columbia University and Union College to see if they would sponsor their medical school. When both declined, Rutgers College in New Jersey was asked and its trustees agreed. Students would get a, a degree through Rutgers even though the medical school was actually located in New York City. In 1827, 27 students began their medical education at Rutgers Medical College in New York City. Pitfall two, the College of Physicians and Surgeons used their influence with the New York State Legislature to get a law passed where out-of-state schools could not grant degrees in New York State. Not to be deterred, the former faculty went across the state trying to find another sponsor. Apparently someone knew Bishop Hobart and it was the bishop who, was, who used his influence to have the trustees agree to have the medical school as a department of Hobart. In October, 1827, the Rutgers Medical Faculty of Geneva College opened in New York City with 125 students. By 1830, over 200 students attended the school and at least 79 degrees were granted. Pitfall number three, through the Attorney General of New York State, the College of Physicians and Surgeons filed a lawsuit against Hobart and won. Under their charter, Hobart was not authorized to maintain a medical school or any other school for that matter outside of Geneva. Three times must have been the charm as the Rutgers Medical Facility of Geneva College ceased to exist. Three years went by and Drs. Thomas Spencer of Madison County, New York and Dr. John Morgan of Auburn began developing plans for a medical school and a Hobart trustee suggested that the school be in Geneva and affiliated with Hobart. Once the New York State Legislature passed a law restoring Hobart's right of granting medical degrees in September, 1834, the Medical Institution of Geneva College became a department of Hobart. And I should point out that the college was always called the Geneva Medical College, but the name did not become official until 1852. Classes began in February, 1835. Now the medical college was first located in houses that Hobart owned around Paltney Park. These were to be temporary quarters as the plan was for Hobart to move from Geneva Hall to another location in Geneva and the medical college would then take over Geneva Hall. It was discovered, however, that too many changes would have to be made to Geneva Hall to accommodate the medical college. So Hobart loaned the medical college $2,500 to construct a new building that, be, that would be right alongside Geneva Hall. Called Middle Building, the facility was brick with a dome rising from the roof in the back. And this was for the operating facility. Um, so those, um, for you, for people from Geneva, Middle Building is where the flagpole is on Hobart campus. It's between uh, Trinity and Geneva Hall. That's where uh, the Middle Building was. Though built specifically for the medical college, middle building would revert to Hobart when it was no longer needed by the medical college. When Hobart decided to stay in Geneva Hall, however, a problem soon developed, cadavers. The sight and smell of dead bodies became unseemly uh, to the rest of the students and faculty. So Hobart wanted the medical college to relocate. In 1841, New York State gave Hobart $15,000 to build a new building on South Main Street near Pulteney Park for the medical college. However, or how the neighbors felt about this um, as a problem with the cadavers was not resolved is unknown, uh, but a building was built, uh, completed in 1843, the Greek revival structure, which, is, which was located around 493 South Main, had a, a dome skylight to illuminate the operating theater. According to an 1844 ad for the college, the building lately erected for use of the medical college is a spacious edifice containing ample lecture and dissecting rooms, a convenient laboratory, elegant apartments for various surgical, pathological, and obstetrical collections, and a cabinet of natural history. This building would be the home to the medical college until it closed in 1872. To attend Geneva Medical College, a prospective student had to be 21, with a good moral character, studied three years with a doctor, have knowledge of Latin and natural philosophy, which is basically the natural sciences, and be able to pay the fees. To graduate, a student had to attend two terms of lectures. Each term was 16 weeks each, write and defend a thesis on an approved medical subject, pass an oral exam, and pay the $20 graduation fee. Upon arriving in Geneva, students registered by entering their name, place of residence, and the doctor whom they had studied, and of course, paying 
the fees. Once registered, each student was, was given tickets and these tickets admitted them to lectures and they were also entrance into the dissecting rooms. Uh, classes included anatomy, uh, physiology, chemistry, principles and practice of surgery, obstetrics, uh, materia medica, which is basically study of drugs, medical jurisprudence and the theory and practice of medicine. By 1869, the study of the eye and mental disease were added. Students basically attended lectures, read supplemental materials and watched surgeries and dissections. Dr. James Webster, the professor of anatomy had quite the reputation for dissecting, demonstrating and giving a lecture all at the same time. Operations were performed for free on members of the general public if performed in front of a class. Periodically, the local newspapers would, would even report of amputations, removal of eyes, um, and other surgeries uh, performed at the colleges. For dissections, corpses were obtained from the Auburn prison. Uh, these were unclaimed bodies of inmates, and when, animal body, and when human bodies couldn't be uh, found, animals were used. Faculty and students also had access to a library and a museum of sorts, which had paper mache, plaster and wax models, various samples, um, an herbarium of vegetables and plants, color drawings of all the plants used in medicines, samples of various drugs, uh, chemistry equipment, and a variety of books, colored plates, and drawings related to medicine. As a department of Hobart, the faculty of the medical college were not treated like the rest of the professors. Some of it could be that classical education was more valued than vocational training, which medicine was considered at the time. The faculty salaries came from the student fees or state appropriations, not from Hobart. The thought here was that since the medical faculty only taught for part of the year from October to January, they were free to devote time to, per, to private practice while the academic faculty taught, taught for a greater part of the year and had in theory, little free time to pursue other employment. Take for example, Dr. Charles Coventry. For 19 years between 1834 and 1853, Coventry was the professor of obstetrics and lived and had a practice in Utica. So for eight weeks of the, out of the year, he taught in Geneva. During his last six years at the medical college, Coventry also taught at the University of Buffalo and still had his private practice in Utica. The medical faculty performed at the pleasure of Hobart trustees, yet no medical professor could be appointed or removed without the approval of a majority of his colleagues. The faculty also were required to teach chemistry and anatomy to the academic students without additional compensation. Despite this, some of the most important names in 19th century medicine began their early careers at the Geneva Medical College. In addition to Geneva, Dr. Willard Parker, uh, who was the professor of anatomy, taught at Colby College, the University of Cincinnati, and Columbia University. In addition to a national reputation as a great teacher and successful surgeon, he wrote various publications on topics like vascular surgery and appendicitis. Dr. Frank Hastings Hamilton, professor of surgery, co-founded the University of Buffalo's medical school and taught at Buffalo, Long Island College Hospital, and Bellevue Hospital Medical College, while maintaining a private and hospital practice. During the Civil War, Hamilton was a surgeon in the 31st New York Volunteers, was a medical director of a corps in the Army of the Potomac and a medical inspector for the United States Army. He also made several technical contributions to surgery. He pioneered the method of healing old ulcers with skin grafting and invented various instruments, including artery forceps, several bone drills, a bullet probe, and light and strong bullet forceps. His numerous books went through several editions and were translated into French and German, including Practical Treatise on Fractures and Dislocations, and the principles and practice of surgery. In 1881, Hamilton was a consulting physician to President James Garfield after he was shot. Dr. Austin Flint, professor of theory and practice of medicine, co-founded the University of Buffalo's medical school. From 1872 to 1885, he was the president of the New York Academy of Medicine, and he served as the president of the American Medical Association in 1884. To get students, ads were placed in newspapers. On May 23rd, 1849, the following ad appeared in the Geneva Daily Gazette. With the faculty acknowledged to be preeminent, with buildings new and excellently adapted to the convenience of the students, with valuable museums and probably the best chemical apparatus in the country, 
and with its situation in a village noted for its hospitality of its inhabitants and for being one of the most pleasant and healthy of the state, with all of these advantages, an institution like the above must prosper. Let those desirous of obtaining instruction remember that now is the time and Geneva the place to attend lectures. Circulars were also placed for each semester. Each circular listed the students, faculty, classes, textbooks, and often previous graduates with their uh, thesis topics. It appears that students came from New York State, New England, and the Mid-Atlantic States. In 1837, the full course of study was $55 with a $20 graduation fee. By 1845, admission was $62, plus there was an additional $3 fee. Uh, graduation fee stayed the same, and board anywhere in town ranged from $1.50 to $2.50 a week. The last year I have information for is 1869. Admission uh, had risen to $67, and there was a $5 fee. Uh, graduation was $20. There was a demonstrator's ticket was $3, um, additional material that you needed was five, and board was anywhere between four and $6 a week. As previously stated, students attended two six-week terms of lectures and wrote a thesis. Um, there were a variety of thesis topics, including sleep, epilepsy, disease of the teeth, fractures, bloodletting, history of medicines, hygiene, and syphilis. Perhaps the most famous medical student uh, was Elizabeth Blackwell. After the death of her father, she sought uh, employment to help support her family, which at the time included her mother, four sisters, and four brothers. With few options open to her, uh, Blackwell became a teacher. She, however, did not like teaching. Since she did not want to marry, Blackwell also had to support herself in addition to her family. Yet she wanted uh, a fulfilling life. Around 1845, a dying friend, um, a dying female friend and historians assumed that it might have been uh, uterine cancer that the, that the friend was dying from, explained how her suffering uh, would have been eased if she had been treated by a female doctor and suggested Blackwell cons consider becoming a doctor. Um, initially, Blackwell was repulsed by the idea of the disease in the body. And I quote her, I hate everything connected with the body and could not bear the sight of a medical book. The very thought of dwelling on the physical structure of the body and its various ailments filled me with disgust. But the more she got to think of it, she thought that her desire for a life of service and challenge could be found through the pursuit of medicine. Of all the challenges Blackwell faced, men and money were her primary ones. She figured she needed approximately $3,000 and today that would be roughly $94,000 for tuition, books, and something to live off of while she pursued her studies. Since, since she was not independently wealthy, she would have to work and save before attending medical school. Men also controlled the access to the training she, re she required and needed. Blackwell continued to teach while taking private lessons with doctors and reading various medical texts. By 1847, Blackwell was living in Philadelphia, which at the time was the medical training capital in the United States. Her goal was to be accepted into medical school and she sought support from the city doctors. There should there should be no surprise that she met with some resistance. There were two schools of thought. Women were intellectually inferior and couldn't handle medical school or Blackwell would prove that women were actually better doctors than men and provide competition. Options presented to her were either to study in Paris or cross-dress and enter medical school as a man. Not deterred, Blackwell began applying to medical schools while continuing her private lessons. Of the roughly 40 medical schools in the country, Blackwell applied to 29. She received negative responses from all but one, Geneva Medical College. While the faculty of the medical college did not want her, they also did not want to offend the doctor who recommended her. So they put the question of Blackwell's admission to the students. As a joke, the students approved her admission, but there is actually two versions of the story. In one version, the students thought that the faculty was joking, so they joined in on the joke by voting to admit Blackwell. In the other version, the students knew the faculty were troubled and that it would probably be funny to admit a woman, so they did. Either way, Blackwell took her acceptance very seriously and she arrived on, in Geneva on November 6, 1847 and registered though five weeks late on the next day as student number 130. Stephen Smith, a fellow classmate, described Blackwell's first day. A hush fell over the class as if each member had been stricken by paralysis. A death-like stillness prevailed during the lecture and only the newly arrived students took notes. 
it was, it was quite impossible to magnify the power of the personality of Miss Blackwell over the lawless elements of the class. The moment that she entered upon the platform, the most perfect order and quiet prevailed. Blackwell wrote to her family, I sometimes think I'm much too disciplined, but it is certainly necessary for the position I occupy. I believe the professors don't know exactly know in what species of human family to place me. And the students are a little bewildered. The other people at first regarded me with suspicion, but I am so quiet and gentle that suspicion turns to astonishment. And even the little boys in the street stand still and stare as I pass, tis droll. Sometimes I laugh, sometimes I feel a little sad, but in Geneva, the nine days wonder soon will cease and I cannot but congratulate myself on having found at last the right place for my beginning. Blackwell made it known that she was there to earn a degree and was to be treated like any other student. Gradually professors and students accepted her, but that did not mean there were moments, especially when delicate subjects came up in lectures. When, for example, the reproductive organs were discussed in an anatomy lecture, Blackwell recalled in her journal, that dissection was just as much as I could bear. Some of the students blush, some were hysterical, not one could keep in a smile. I had to pinch my hand, the blood nearly came, and call on Christ to help me from smiling, but that would have ruined everything. Overall, Blackwell led a very quiet life. She wrote, I lived in my room in my college and the outside world made little impression on me. Though the faculty and students accepted her, the community was mixed. Doctors' wives ignored her and people stopped and stared as she made her way to and from lectures. Blackwell would write, I afterwards found that I had so shocked Geneva propriety that the theory was fully established either that I was a bad woman whose designs would gradually become evident or that being insane an outbreak of insanity would soon be apparent. Feeling the unfriendliness of the people though, quite unaware of this gossip, I never walked abroad. Since the term went from October to January, uh, Blackwell went to Philadelphia between terms where she interned at the Bl Blackie Elms House, a hospital for the poor. Despite resentment from male residents, they walked out of the wards when she walked in and stopped filling out charts when she was on duty. She treated patients and gathered material on typhus that she would use for her graduate thesis. Blackwell can uh, return to Geneva for her second term in October 1848, which appeared uneventful and she graduated on the top of her class on Jan January 23rd, 1849. Blackwell participated in the graduation ceremony with some modifications. First, she chose not to wear the traditional robe of a graduate. Instead, she bought a new black silk dress trimmed at the cuff and collar with white lace. She hesitated to spend the money, but didn't want, she explained to her family, to disgrace womankind, the college, or the Blackwells by presenting myself in a shabby gown. Second, she did not walk in the procession. Typically, graduates walked from the medical college to the Presbyterian Church on Paltney Park, along with the president, dean, and faculty. Blackwell refused on the grounds that it was unladylike to march in processions. Instead, she entered with her brother Henry, the only family member to come for the ceremony, and sat quietly until her name was called. Once she received her diploma, Blackwell sat with the other graduates. Blackwell continued to fight for opportunities for women to learn and practice medicine. In 1853, with two other female doctors, including her younger sister, Emily, Blackwell opened a small clinic where people could receive treatment for little or no cost. A few years later, the dispensary became the New York Infirmary for Women and Children, now the New York Presbyterian Lower Manhattan Hospital. In 1868, she co-founded the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary, making it the third medical college for women in the United States. A year later, Blackwell moved permanently to England, where she became the first woman to be included in the medical register. And this was the official list of all the medical practitioners in England. In 1874, she co-founded the London School of Medicine for Women, now the University College of London Medical School. She also wrote books and advocated for a variety of reforms, including family planning, sex education for children, hygiene, sanitation, preventative medicine, and of course, the need for more female doctors. Unfortunately, Geneva Medical College closed its door to women after Blackwell's graduation. The 1840s would be the best years for the medical college. During the 1850s and 1860s, there was a steady decline in enrollment and prestige. There were several reasons for this decline. First, there was competition from other schools. New medical schools in places like Albany and Buffalo were drawing students and professors away from Geneva. Second, there was not a local hospital for clinical training. 
Doctors and hospitals, not medical schools, were expected to provide practical training for students. In Geneva, there was not enough doctors, nor did a wide variety of cases exist to provide adequate bedside training. Though a charter had been granted for the creation of a Geneva hospital, there was not enough money to actually build and fund one. Third was the Blackwell effect. Many students and doctors refused to be associated with an institution that admitted and granted a degree to a woman. Fourth, professional inbreeding. The medical college hired way too many of its recent graduates as professors. Fifth was Geneva's location itself. The access to the Erie Canal and the railroad did not reach Geneva as quickly as other places, which prevented easy access for out-of-town out students. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, were the reforms and medical education itself. After the Civil War, an increasing emphasis was being placed on good teaching, practical training, and research. This, of course, called for an overhaul of medical education. Full-time, scientifically trained faculty were needed to educate the next generation of doctors. The need for problem solvers and critical thinkers met an emphasis on laboratory work and clinical training, not memorizing or observing. This meant a medical school had to be connected to a hospital, a focus on producing new knowledge through research needed facilities to conduct research, faculty to oversee it, and opportunities to pursue it. There were changes for students as well. No longer would the ability to pay the fees be a priority for admission. Instead of two six-week terms, the course of study was lengthened into three to four years and an undergrad degree became a requirement for admission. Gradually, the current standard for medical training was put into place. Four years of undergrad, four years of medical college, and three to seven years of residency program. Getting back to the Geneva Medical College, by 1870, there were so few medical students that Hobart trustees proposed starting a day school in some of the empty classrooms. On July 12, 1871, the trustees voted to discontinue the medical college after February 1872. A month later, Professor John Toller asked if he could have the medical college's equipment, collection, and library. The trustees said no, but they would sell it to him at a price. So Toller purchased what he wanted. Toller and another professor then approached the newly formed Syracuse University with a proposal. Toller would donate his recent medical college purchases in exchange for the university reestablishing the medical college in Syracuse. Syracuse had several advantages over Geneva. The two primary advantages were its central location, which made it easy for both faculty and students to get to, and with St. Joseph's Hospital, practical training and teaching could be provided to students. In November 1871, the Onondaga County Medical Society meant to review the proposal and they approved it. A month later, Syracuse University's board approved the plan and a faculty was selected in January with a majority of the positions going to former professors of the Geneva Medical College. On October 3rd, 1872, classes began at the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Syracuse University with students from Geneva Medical College grandfathered in. The college had a three-year graded curriculum where students had to pass exams in each subject before advancing on. Students also had to write and defend a thesis. The Geneva Medical College existed for 37 years. Between 1834 and 1871, Geneva Medical College graduated 701 students. It was the first school in the United States to grant a medical degree to a woman once the medical college moved out, the middle building housed Hobart's literary uh, department. Basically, it became the library. In 1885, the structure burned down. Okay. Since the medical college was no longer using the building near 493 South Main, Hobart eventually put it up for sale. On November 20th, 1877, however, that building too burned down. Um, apparently between May and November of that year, a series of fires plagued Geneva and come to find out it was actually board members of the fire department who were setting fires around town. I guess they didn't have enough to keep them busy. So they started to, they, they decided to set fires. Uh, the fire originated in the cupola and rapidly ate its way through the building. The building was uh, virtually, the building with virtually all of its remaining contents were destroyed Supposedly, the $100,000 insurance money and the salvage stones from uh, the building at 493 South Main were used to build Merritt Hall on Hobart's campus. 
Despite several name changes, the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Syracuse University still exists today as SUNY Upstate Medical College. With its connection to Geneva Medical College, Upstate Medical is the second oldest medical school in New York State. And that is the story of Geneva Medical College. And Anne, if we have any questions, I'd be happy we, to. Yes, uh, we've got, well, we had one at the beginning, which I think you answered, but I'll read it oh. in case there was anything okay. you wanted to add. Um, was, oh, now I've lost, okay, let me get the chat back. It's wandering around. <laughs> um, was there any woman after Elizabeth that went to Geneva Medical College? Was there any backlash to her admittance and graduation? Um, there wasn't, I, there, as far as I know, they did not, they stopped admitting women after Blackwell. Um, her sister, Emily Blackwell actually tried to apply there. That was one of several medical colleges that she applied and they denied her application. Um, I will point out this, the professors and students of the medical college became very supportive of Blackwell. They just, they, they, it was a mutual respect. They showed that she was very serious and they could learn a lot from her and she could learn a lot from them. Um, it was the community where there was some mixed results. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, and then let's see, got, that was the beginning, scroll through. Um, Ann Chatsky asked if Blackwell Die, did Blackwell die in England? If so, where is she buried? And what motivated her to, re, to uh, what drew Blackwell to England? Oh, okay. Um, actually, Blackwell was born in England. She was born in 1821 in England, and she came with her family to the United States. Um, in she was 11 years old, so about 1832, 1833, she came to the United States. Um, and then what happened is she had a large family. So some of her family went to England, some of them stayed in the United States. And I think she just, um, she said in her diaries that she felt more at home in London. Uh, she thought that there were better opportunities for female doctors in the United States, uh, but she felt more at home in England. So she went back there in the 1870s. I believe she, and I could be wrong. You can, my favorite term is Google it. <laughs> I believe she died in Scotland and I think she's buried in Scotland. Um, so if I'm, someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but she, I believe it's, I think she died and it's buried in Scotland. I don't know if anybody has any other questions they want to add into the chat. I do have one in case anyone wants <laughs> to type something now. Um, where did Emily go to medical college? Because I think I knew that, but I can't re recall. Yes. Okay. She actually went to two places, believe it or not. So you had to take when Emily went to college in the 1850s, you still had to take those two six week terms. She did one term, I believe it was a school in Chicago. Her main supporter left at the end of her first term to do some study in Europe and the board and faculty got together and said, oh, we don't want you anymore. So she had to go mm -hmm. to another school. And I think she went, it's a, a medical school in, in Cleveland that had graduated the second uh, female doctor in the United States. So I think that was pretty shabby on the mm. part of, I, I can't, the, the name of the school is escaping me, but that was pretty, that was pretty shady. So yeah, they should be ashamed of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, and I yeah. know there were some that went to um, some of the eclectic and homeopathic colleges as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, by that time, in the 1850s, there were two schools for women, two medical schools, one in Philadelphia and one in Boston. I don't know why Emily didn't apply to those. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, we do have, uh, somebody wanted to know if this will be available for later viewing. And uh, yes, it will be. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're recording as we speak. And then I just have to make sure that we get it up on our website, but yes, this will be recorded. And, uh, were the terms six or 16 weeks and did most students graduate in two years? It was six, it was 16, 16 weeks, uh, in October to January and, and most students, from my understanding did. The interesting thing is I believe, so you had to do the two terms. You basically attended the same lectures. So yeah, it, it didn't change why they said the two terms is, I, I don't know. I think it requires a drill little bit research. That was I the, guess it was, yeah, the drill and kill. Yeah, so it was the same, you took the same professor. Yeah, same textbooks, same everything. So yeah, but it's, uh, six, oh. it's 16, yeah, 16. And, and Jane did add uh, Central Medical College in Syracuse. I 
think that's where Sarah Adamson Dolly went, perhaps, uh, who was the first woman doctor in Rochester. Uh, and, she, and Jane put that uh, it, yes, okay, I knew it was something similar to that. Uh, she, they admitted women in October of 49. So yeah, Emily could have gone there as well. Yeah. But it may have also depended on fees and a, a variety of who was going to let her live with them because you couldn't just go get an apartment. Yeah, no, she had quite a time where basically Elizabeth stayed in Philadelphia and waited to hear. Emily went, I think she even tracked up to New Hampshire. There was a school in New Hampshire and she got up there and they said, oh, you actually came, but no, thank you. And so she had to, she had to rethink. So I think it took, a, Elizabeth, I think opened the door, but I think Emily had, had to be just as strong as Elizabeth to continue. Cause it took, she, she got the door slammed on her face quite a number of times. So yeah, yeah it was not for the undetermined. You really had to have a, a sense of mission. I think, I think, yeah, to yeah. accomplish things in those circumstances. Yeah. Uh, Joyce did look up for us. Um, oh. Blackwell is buried in Kilmoon, Scotland. She died oh, from a stroke hey. at 89 in England. So they must have hey. transported her body. 89. So there we go. Yeah. She, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Any, thank any you, Joyce, questions? for doing that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Any other questions from it? You gotta love Google. You can <laughs> fact check this whole talk if you want. Oh, I think Pim has one. Oh, Sorry, I can't okay. hear no, you, that's... Pim. Hi. No, I. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we I can. can. Yeah. Yes, well, we can. I, I don't have a question, but um, I had just read uh, there is a book that is called The Doctor's Black Blackwell. How? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah. Mary's got it right here. <laughs> so yes, this just came out last week, and it's a oh, joint bi it's a joint biography. Did you show of, it already? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I just went to get this for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there will be if you're a follower of our blog, I'll have a link to the this this Friday for our blog. If anybody, you can email me. I can send you can find the book on Amazon. But it, it literally just came out last week, and it's a joint biography of Elizabeth and okay. and Emily. So, yeah, $28. Yes. Or there's a discount on Amazon. You know, you can shop around Barnes and Noble. You can, or you can check the library. I would hope that the library would definitely would have this on their shelf. And uh, also, uh, Jane had a, a look, because I know Jane's got a program on women physicians as well. So she's got a lot of expertise in this. Uh, she said that Dr. Kate Jackson of The Water Cure in Dansville, and Jane spoke about that at one of our lectures a couple of years ago. Uh, Dr. Kate Jackson studied with Emily Blackwell in New yeah. York City at the Women's Medical College there. Oh. And then another question uh, was, why did they not accept any other women? Was it the college or the city? Do you have a sense of the answer to that, <laughs> that question? <laughs> that, I, that I don't know. I honestly, I don't know. I think they gave it a try and they just, yeah, I don't know. I, I honestly, that requires a bit more research. Um, I think they probably, we gave it a try. Blacko was good. I think we're done. We tried the experiment. Let's go on our merry way with not accepting women, with mm -hmm. not accepting women. This is all just a fad. Yeah. <laughs> Don't look behind the curtain. No yeah. one will notice. Yeah. We can just yeah. go on the way we were. I'm sure yeah. that some of that was, was part of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Carrie, in the letter you read, it sounded as if she was in a rooming house with three other students. No, the letter that I read came from, um, it is a gentleman by the name of Joseph Banks. He oh. lived with three other students. Blackwell had her own room in a boarding house that was near the college. I think it was called like Hamilton's boarding house, but it was it was a short walk from the college. So um, students had to find their own room and board. It sounds like uh, Joseph Banks had, yeah, four guys living together in the 1840s, each taking a turn to cook the meals. I think that's quite a quite an arrangement to have. not so different from today actually no not yeah not so different yeah not so different so and um, and there, that is something to talk, oh, oh go ahead sherry there was there was a talk um at noon uh with betty bear from hobart and william smith and janice mm -hmm. i think her last name is namura yes there was yes yeah and i think they recorded it so probably anybody who's interested in it, it, it was good. It was very good. Yeah, no, I was part of that too. Yeah, I thought it was good. It probably will be somewhere on the uh, HWS website if anybody is interested. Yeah, probably. Yeah. 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 Um, I'll keep an eye. I can, we, um, and does weekly updates. I can definitely keep an eye on that and share that link if and, if and when it comes out. So. Mm -hmm. 
Did you want to ask? Yeah, yeah. Camille wants to ask a question. Okay, go right oh. ahead. I just wanted to add something to it about why the medical college came to Geneva in the first place. I don't know how much you mentioned about the financial situation which the uh, Hobart was at this point because it had a great deal of benefit for Geneva to get the college over here just because they had faculty and they had uh, only 20 or 30 years before the medical college came here, Hobart had only six students. And mm -hmm. I don't think they could get very far with six or seven students. <laughs> That's for sure. Yep. Yep. The financial and definitely this it was a good it was a good thing for Hobart. Yep. And one of the two college programs that they did, one at eleven and one at twelve, and I can't remember which one, they did say how that happened. Mm -hmm. Dr. Spencer, who was involved here with uh, Hobart to begin with, he also was very much involved in New York City, you know, with Columbia. That's it. With the competition of Columbia. Mm -hmm. That had to do with transferring this uh, multiple transfers, which were always mixed somehow by the political uh, enemies. <laughs> oh yeah, you. I think the the was it the physician, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, uh, very well connected. Yeah. I think it would be a, uh, I would put any political fit against them in this day and age to see how they would come out on top. Yeah, yeah, yeah it would be. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for sharing, and thank you too, Jane, for sharing too. Oh, Jane, go ahead. I just wanted to call uh, comment that when Central Medical College in Syracuse. Uh, started advertising in the uh, fall of 1849, they, their first ad specifically said that because of the success of Miss Blackwell in Geneva, they were going to open up their college doors to, to, to study. Oh, that's, yeah, and, no. and there were seven, seven women in that first class. And if you go into the medical history <clears throat> book, um, uh, um, Lydia Folger Fowler, who graduated there in 1850 uh, is still counted as the second woman in the U.S. to get a medical degree, even though a lot of historians and archivists don't count Central Medical College as a legitimate college. Yeah, still, they're using they're using uh, uh, Ms. Mrs. Fowler as an example of the the second woman to gain mm. a medical degree. Yeah. So Sarah Adamson Dolly graduated from there, as well as Rachel Brooks Gleason. Um, yeah, there were there were quite a few women who were looking to uh, gain a medical degree who applied as soon as it was uh, 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 outed that w that Elizabeth had gained access that she'd been admitted and th and there were other women who applied but they were they were all rebuffed. Uh, I mean even even before Elizabeth graduated they they weren't taking anybody. Yeah. So fascinating stuff it is no it is it is it is fascinating it is and we also oh, had the question i wanted to mention is that, that elizabeth was the reason she was the breakthrough she was the reason why central medical college and then later the first syracuse medical college in 1852 uh admitted women and mm -hmm. you know they were at the time the only two co-educational medical schools in the country uh, women had to go to an all women's medical school if they didn't go to those two. Mm -hmm. And we did have a, another question in the chat. Is there a book that dovetails with your talk, Carrie? <laughs> Is there a book? <laughs> um, no, but I would suggest if you are interested, um, Blackwell did write her memoir and you can find it on Amazon or maybe the library has it. And it's opening the medical profession to women. And I highly, highly recommend it. If you're interested, it just, it's her. Um, we have a 1970 version here at the museum, but I think it was reissued in April of 2015 or 2017. So, and that it's all from her perspective. And it's interesting too, because um, in the appendix, she also includes um, an article by one of her fellow students or at the medical college. So you can get a, a, 
one of her contemporaries, his input on what it was like to have Elizabeth there. So that's, I would, there you have Elizabeth's book, book, and then you have the brand new, The Doctors Blackwell, How Two Pioneering Sisters Brought med Medicine to Women and Women to Medicine. I think those would be two books um, to get you started if you're interested. And the other standard um, one for the history of women, not just Blackwell, but all women in uh, medicine is, Regina Morant Sanchez's Sympathy and Science, um, which is an overview from the early American history. I think it's just American, though I spent a long time since I read it. Uh, that's kind of the standard that a lot of the history starts from. Um, if you can find a copy of it, I have a copy in my office, uh, <laughs> but I don't know if there are any in the local libraries. Um, there's also one called, which is on my table over here because I have not read it yet by Ellen Moore, who writes a lot about Sarah Adamson Dolly and um, looked at a lot of papers in the Rochester uh, archives at the University of Rochester Medical School. Yep. Um, and that's a pretty well uh, respected book as well. So there's a lot of options out there, particularly if you look at um, credentialed historians, there's also much more um, general histories, but if you're looking for some of those greater details like Carrie's uh, dealt with today, those are probably some of the ones you want to look at. I think we'll leave it now. Okay. Are there any books on Geneva Medical College? No. Okay, I didn't think so. <laughs> no, no, you can visit our archives. Yeah, yeah visit there's, but there are no, there are no books. No. My next project. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. <laughs> any other questions or comments? Uh, Pim, did you have another question? No, I was just saying thank you. Oh. <laughs> oh. All righty. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I would say we should all sing happy birthday to Elizabeth Blackwell, but I won't make you do that. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And be sure to fill out your uh, evaluation form when you get one. <laughs> <laughs>